Now, before I started this trilogy, I really started going off on the guys, can you please stop telling everybody that they're going to cry when they read these books? Hey, what's up, bookworms and beloved? We are back again to talk a little Realm of the Elderlings, guys. Today, we're going to be dipping into the Tawny Man trilogy by Robin Hobb, the first lady of epic fantasy, guys. This is Fool's Aaron. This is Golden Fool. And this is Fool's Fate, released back to back to back between 2001 and 2003. This is the third trilogy, guys, within the Realm of the Elderlings. So, books number seven eight, and nine overall. This is the direct sequel, though, to the Forest Hill trilogy way back when, which I started back in early of 2021. So, uh, guys, this is uh, I decided I'm not going to be reviewing Robin Hobb books individually going forward. I'm going to be doing them as a sub-series, and I'll be doing that uh, spoiler-free, and then we'll be doing our panel of the Elderlings with uh, Philip, myself, Madison, Jake, and who am I, who am I missing here? Uh, Scott, the bald, bald booktuber. Lots of names to throw out here. Uh, we'll be doing those uh, later on. So uh, look for the uh, spoiler panel to be sometime in May. I think we are talking about getting together then. We've already done the one for Live Shirt Traders and Far Shirt Trilogy if you are looking to be entertained. But guys, we got to talk about the Tawny Man Trilogy now. So when they had a lot of expectations going in, because I know there are a lot of fans within the Realm of the Eldlings who say this is their favorite trilogy. So uh, let's go ahead and kick it off, guys, and begin like usual. Let's talk about what is this trilogy about now. 15 years have passed since the end of the Red Ship War with the terrifying Out Islanders. Since then, Fitz has wandered the world, accompanied only by his wolf and whip partner, Night Eyes. Finally settling in a tiny cottage as remote from Buckkeep, and the far seers as possible. But lately, the world has come crashing in again. The witted are being persecuted because of their magical bonds with animals. And young Prince Dutiful has gone missing just before his crucial diplomatic wedding to an out-islander princess. Fitz's assignment to fetch Dutiful back in time before the ceremony seems very much like a fool's errand. But the dangers ahead could signal the end of the far seer reign. Guys, 2001, 2002, 2003, this is the Tawny Man trilogy. Okay, guys, let's go ahead and dive into it. Let's talk about what makes this trilogy good and what makes this trilogy bad. Well, I think with this one, guys, I'm going to begin with the good. As always, Robin Hobb's characters are the selling point here. It is the characters and the relationships. Every single Robin Hobb review, I'm pretty sure I'm going to begin with this when I talk about the good. And much like previously, guys, these books, uh, they're about the daily lives of these characters. Uh, it's one of those things where you say, what is the primary thing here? Is it a plot or is it the characters in their daily life? It is definitely their daily life. Now, obviously, there is a plot or else you wouldn't have very much to talk about in an interview like this. But uh, it's one of those common uh, criticisms, I think, that come up with Robin Hobb is that, well, not a lot happens in her books. A lot happens, just not in a way that a usual fantasy trilogy probably would. And I think that's just kind of one of those things, either you're in or you're out on the realm of the Eldlings because that's just Robin Hobb's style. She does take a long time to say what some other authors could say really quickly. But thankfully, she says it very beautifully. And that's another one of the good things here. I got to say, she continues to wow me with her writing style. I'm not a pro snob, guys. I bear, like, there'll be authors that I'm reading and people are like, oh my God, his writing is just so bad. And I'm like, huh, I didn't notice like at all. So I feel like if I notice that something is really standing out, uh, they really are just a beautiful writer. But I, I feel like every time that Robin Hobb does this... Uh, this slice of life. She's almost as good at it as my personal fave, Stephen King. I feel like he is the champ at that. And I will say in Fool's Errand, the first book in this trilogy, I think it's on par with what King does, is that I have just spent one third of this first book doing absolutely nothing except hanging out in a cottage with these characters I love, and I'm having a great time. I never once, I'm like, hey, okay, let's get on with it. And that's amazing. That's amazing work that you can do that. And I think that her and Stephen King are two of the only ones I think that can do that and keep me entertained. So yeah, uh, again, when I make that comparison, guys, I know if you're not a big Stephen King fan writer, you're like, oh, she's way better than Stephen King. That's fine. If you think that, that's great. Stephen King's my favorite author ever. So that... That, that praise coming from me means quite a bit because I think he's the best at it. And she's right there. She's sitting at that table with him, I think. But I, I do think that you can sum up uh, 300 pages 
of some of these books in a sentence. And that's not meant as a criticism. It just means you can look back. Okay, I just read 300 pages. And what all has happened? Oh, this. And you're done. And you, you, that isn't necessarily a bad thing. Uh, again, that's one of those kind of things I think is either going to be for you or not. Uh, in some bits of this trilogy, it is very much for me. Some, well, we'll talk about when we get there. But as for the good parts of it, I, I think that when she's really, really doing that well, she is one of the best to do it. I love that you get to see some of them older legacy characters again. This was one of those things that when I first started reading this, I had no idea how much I miss these characters from the first year children. Because you, you, it's it's not a big secret. I wasn't wild about Assassin's Quest. I thought it ended really well. It started really good. But there was a real, real, real big sloggy part right in the middle of it that really brought that book down for me. So I was like, I'm, 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 I'm glad to be taking a break from Realm of the Eldlings. That's kind of how I felt about it. And I did take a longer break than I intended to. But uh, with this, once I was right back in here, and it's just the very beginning, you got Fitz talking to Chate, and I'm like, oh my God, I am so into this. And it was like emotionally powerful, like right off the bat, I couldn't believe it. So I was like, okay, yeah, Robin Hobb is very, very good at this. She's, she sucked me right back into this world, and I am fully invested with what's going on, and that's why Fool's Aaron, guys, just an amazing book, which I'll get more into, but I think that the emotional weight she's able to put in these books. I make the joke all the time about, guys, quit telling everybody you're chasing people off. It's like how Will of Time fans always tell everybody, well, you know, books 7 through 10 are really, really boring. You're not getting a lot of people to read that. Always just telling people, oh, yeah, these books are great. They'll make you cry. That doesn't exactly have someone being like, oh, i got to read these right now. You know, that doesn't really get people excited. So I think that's really kind of a poor selling point. But Robin Hobb will get you. She'll get you one way or the other. Uh, there was one where I just didn't expect it coming. And boom, the next thing I know, allergies, allergies, allergies. Uh, she's very, very good at this, guys. And it isn't just simply characters dying kind of thing. It's just because you're so attached to these characters and how they interact with each other. And when something, you know, that's hurtful can happen, uh, it doesn't even necessarily have to be a character death. You can feel emotionally involved, you know, feel like if that character got hurt, you're hurting with them. And that just means she's a master at character work and I think it really does matter here and uh yeah it's uh, emotional weight is not undersold it really is when people always tell you that they're they're saying it for a reason because it gets just about everyone but not only can she hurt you with words like I said she can amaze you with how beautiful they are so um I, I think that she continues to build up her history of her world here uh I, I think that you know you get to know a lot more about the wit why the wit is looked down upon uh, you get to know the history of the Piebald Prince. If you didn't read The Willful Princess and the Piebald Prince uh, novella before you read this, uh, that'll give you a lot of context, and that's a really, really quick, cozy read. I really did like that. Glad I read it before this trilogy because it, it gave me a lot more context because the whole time I'm like, oh, they're talking about this Piebald Prince thing. It sounds very, very interesting. I want to know more about it. But I feel like she gives you enough of it. You know, she has those epigraphs before each chapter begins. That's a little bit of a history and things like that. It helps kind of open that up, but you get to know a lot more about why why was Bert such an asshole in that first trilogy about the wit and stuff? You see now why people frown upon the wit so much. And you're like, oh, well, it still seems kind of like, well, you might be overreacting just a little bit, but you understand. You understand now why uh, Birch wasn't just being a jerk. He was trying to protect Fitz. And I think that was something that was kind of, you know, you have that first-person narrative uh, with Fitz as opposed to live ship books, and you can only see it from his point of view. And that first one, he thought, oh, Fitz is just, be or Burge is just being a jerk, right? And you see, obviously, as the reader, we've come to know, no, Burge actually really deeply cares for him, you know? But uh, th that's just one of those things I think that I just love the way that she expanded that and gave me the understanding of why Burge was kind of acting like that in the original Farster trilogy, and again, why everyone is not too happy about wit users. Uh, but I think it plays a huge part, the wit, uh, obviously, when you got the relationship between Fitz and Night Eyes, which is, you know, 15, 17 years strong at this point. And it's one of those things where I'm like, gosh, I just want to know about their adventures. You know, I, I was like, I'm glad they aged Fitz up. I am. I'm glad she aged him up because I didn't want another uh, teen angsty kind of Fitz book. I didn't with him making bad choices. Now, look, Fitz still makes bad choices. It's kind of what he does the best. <laughs> but uh, it, it, it's one of those things where I'm glad that she aged him up a little bit. And you still, like I said, you'll just want to be strangling them like you will one of your kids, but not not in that way where you're just like, God, kids are stupid, you know, <laughs> nothing like that. But uh, again, I, I like that, and I like that it just shows that, okay, these two have shared every moment together for the last 15 years, and their bond is just so incredible, beyond just a whip bond. It's, it's just a, 
uh, a man and his faithful companion kind of bond. I love that. I love that stuff. And again, the fact that she's able to give Night Eyes a voice is a cheat code when it comes to animal companions. Night Eyes is uh, one of the best, I think, ever. I, I love the theme of this. It kind of like, you know, Fitz has been like, I left that life behind. But it kind of has that Godfather, every time I think I'm out, they pull me back in kind of moment. You have that where he does still feel a sense of duty and, uh, and, and responsibility for certain things. And I think seeing him play kind of the uh, the father role to not only uh, Hap, but also to Dutiful in this trilogy is some stuff that's just really great. Uh, it will give you some of that, that dad shit, and then you will obviously uh, see returning characters, obviously, that will give you some some dad shit, as I like to call it. And uh, this, that stuff's all great. Uh, anytime you start dealing with, with fathers and sons, I'm a big softy. I'm a huge, huge softy. I, I mean, I used to be like, I don't see why everybody gets out of that. And, like, I remember... Filled of Dreams. I thought that was a great baseball movie. I never understood why everybody just sobbed like crazy. I didn't have a close relationship with my father, so I didn't really get it. But once I had kids, I went back and watched that movie. Buckets, okay? Buckets. And that's kind of how it is with me now. Anything that has to deal with a father and a son and a close relationship or or missed opportunities, things like that, I am just a, a mess. I'm a mess with it. And she really does always hit on those things so much. But uh, I, I love that... Fitz trying to learn to trust again, basically, and kind of form his own coterie. That's something that was a really, really great, well-earned arc in this trilogy. I really did appreciate her slow rolling that to a point that when it all came together, it was like, yeah, yeah, here we go. Avengers Assemble. It felt like that. I loved it a lot. But uh, finally coming to uh, love the fool as a character like everyone else. Because I know when I finished uh, Farseer, I was kind of like, I don't know, it's it's kind of a weirdo. I don't, I don't, I don't, I guess I didn't find him as endearing as everyone else. Uh, you do, you do come to, to love the fool over the course of this trilogy. Like I said, I call my kids beloved now because of the fool. Uh, but, uh, continuing to just grow that bond, uh, between him and Fitz. And, and it's just so many things that were confirmed for me from other series. <laughs> you know, that was really, really cool. So there, that is another thing. There is tie-ins to Live Ship. I know a lot of people said, you know, can I read Live Ship? You know, it's like, of course you can. You can do that. Or do I have to read Live Ship? I mean, I, I hope you do because Live Ship's amazing. But it is rewarding that there are some characters from Live Ship that do show up in this trilogy and it'll give you a lot more context to them. So uh, don't skip Live Ship, as my boy Jake Bishop would say. Uh, very, very happy. Uh, to see all those connections. But yeah, uh, again, that relationship between those two characters really, really does grow here, and you get so many answers to things you might have had questions about. But guys, what didn't work for me? I never like to really use the phrase bad, even though I know it's in this category. I just say maybe some things that didn't work for me, they might work out just fine for you, or they may not have bothered me that much, but you know, I want to bring them up in case you want to know about them. This trilogy is dreadfully slow-paced, guys. Like, dreadfully I mean, if you thought that Live Ship Traders was slow, if you thought Farseer was slow, I don't know if this one's going to be for you. Pacing in this is absolutely glacial. And I mean that more ways than one. And here's the deal. is I think that Fool's Errand, perfect. That is my favorite book out of the nine that I have read so far. That book is amazing. It really, really is. Golden Fool... Not so much. Fool's Fate, it didn't click with me like it clicks with everyone else. And I'll get into that a little bit more in a minute. But you spend a lot of time dealing with tasks that could be handled rather briefly. I know I said I don't consider it a bad thing that you could sum up 300 pages in one sentence. Sometimes, though, it's like, okay, I've spent enough time with this little kind of task. Can we Can we really move it along? Because it's like... Not only is it taking forever, it's just repeating. I had this problem with Royal Assassin I brought up. It's like, you just did that 100 pages ago. Now you're doing it again. Like, exactly the same. Like, nothing's changing. And that that that, that's, that can be rough. That can be rather, really rough. And I think that, I got to say, guys, this trilogy suffers from a lot of the things, a lot of the problems I had, and was critical of Will of Time about. And I think that that is a very, very apt comparison because I feel like it's a lot of the same because a lot of people will be like, yeah, well, with the, this series, though, I like hanging out with the characters. I mean, I liked hanging out with the characters in Wheel of Time. I love those characters like they were my family. The slog was still the slog, though, right? And I kind of feel the same here. So uh, character deaths, uh, they're going to happen. That isn't anything that I have a problem with. I'm a big grimdark reader. So uh, I, I think, you know, I cut my teeth on Song of Ice and Fire. So I'm good. When characters need to be taken away, I understand that authors need to do that. It's the real world. It's going to happen sometimes. However, I kind of feel like this trilogy handles some of those things like the Disney Star Wars sequels did, where I felt like, hey, you're just bringing back those legacy characters to kill them now. 
that really bothered me. And uh, I know I got a lot of pushback from that on my Discord saying, oh, I never looked at it that way at all. Okay, that's great. It's a different experience, I think, for everybody. For me, I just, I didn't appreciate it. That's kind of what it felt like it was doing. It's like you brought a particular character back just to do that for the emotional weight of it. And I, I just didn't like it. I just didn't like it at all. Uh, but uh, you know what? The ending of the book is really, really awesome, Fool's Fate. But that was just one thing that I know that a lot of people put as like one of their top moments in the series. And I was just mad about it. I wasn't even sad. So maybe it's just me. I don't know. I can admit that, guys. Look, I, it's one of those things when I criticize one of these books that is just beloved by everybody. I can accept that it was a me problem. It's not a book problem. And I don't think it's a book problem. That was just something that was a sticking point for me. And it made it hard for me to get into it. Now, guys, why should you read it? Look, if you liked Farseer, especially if you're one of those who thought Assassin's Quest was fine, I think you're going to be right back at home here. It's going to be like slipping on a comfortable pair of sweatpants. You're going to be very, very happy. Because, I mean, even with the hangups I had about Assassin's Quest, I dove right back into this world just like that. I was all in within the first chapter of A Fool's Errand. And I think that uh, you will too, if you're really, really into that. Like I said, though, if you if you were thinking, that, okay, Farseer was kind of slow, Live Ship Traders was even more slow, this, it, it, this might be the hopping off point for you because this is slower than both of those, slower paced. And uh, I do feel like a lot happens because you do get answers to a lot of things. You get answers about the forge. You get answers about the pale woman, the elderlings, the fool's past. You've got all kinds of things in this that you want to know about. You will get those answers. It just does take a long time to get there. You know, journey, destination, blah, 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 blah. But look, if you don't mind a slow burn, if you like beautifully written fantasy with tons of slice of life and characters just doing daily tasks, the daily minutia of life, I think you'll be quite happy. You'll be quite, quite happy here. And again, like I said, if you are if you were one of those people who appreciates beautiful writing first, uh, this is going to be your series, without a doubt. Uh, if you're one of those who need a constant moving plot, you're going to struggle a little bit, I think. Because I think there is a stretch between... All of Golden Fool and about a third of Fool's Fate where I'm like, wow, really, I don't think anything's happened in like a thousand pages now. That's going to happen. That's going to happen. But uh, again, uh, like I said, I am in the unpopular opinion on this. Uh, just about everyone else says that this trilogy is amazing, whereas I feel like about half of it I could have done without. And that's just me being, being honest here. So uh, my final thoughts, guys, I think I just kind of started with them. Uh, look, this trilogy has my favorite book in the series. And then it has uh, two books that are also on my bottom third of the nine that I've read. I love Fool's, Fool's Errand. I thought it was absolutely perfect. It was the book I had been waiting for Farseer to be the entire time I read it. I felt like this was Robin Hobb finally coming into the peak of her powers. It was amazing. And then Golden Fool and Fool's Fate. To me, guys, it is the equivalent to the slog in Wheel of Time. And again, I get that pushback about, well, I like spending time with these characters. I like spending time with the Wheel of Time characters too. But book seven, or I'm sorry, I think seven was fine, but eight, nine, ten, yeah, yeah, really, really, really painfully slow. And I think I got to kind of compare it like this. Golden Fool is the path of daggers of the series and that you're going to spend the entire book talking about what you're going to do next book. Yeah. And Fool's Fate to me is uh, Winter's Heart where it's like dreadfully slow and then you have a banger of an ending so everybody kind of sees past the warts of the first, you know, 60% of that book. So I, I'm going to make that comparison because, guys, I feel like uh, if you like Wheel of Time, you're going to like Realm of the Eldings. If you like Realm of the Eldings, you're going to like Wheel of Time. So I think that those kind of do feel like brother-sister series to me. And uh, I, I think that there's a lot to be compared there. And look, these are series I do love. I do have criticisms of them, though. And it's one of those things where, look, I enjoyed a lot of this trilogy. It has my favorite book in the series so far. But a lot of it I did not enjoy. And I think that's just uh, something I got to be kind of honest about. And that's why I would say right now, I would say Live Ship's number one, Farseer's number two, and this comes in number three for me as far as ranking the trilogies thus far. So uh, with me, I need a little bit more plot. I'm fine with Slice of Life. I love Slice of Life, but I, I do need a little bit more plot. And I think Golden Fool just being like, okay, at the midway point, here's what our goal is. And it's a whole nother book's worth of content before we even get to the beginning of that task. That really, really just brought it down for me. So uh, look, yeah, Fool's Fate, I know that's a lot of people's 
favorite book in the series. One or two, it seems like that one. And Assassin's Fate are always like one, two. Is Assassin's Fate? I think the last book, right? Uh, I get those last books just so confused. But I got these confused before I read them. Just like a name generator of a series, isn't it? But I feel like those are always one, two with people when they're ranking these books. But uh, for me, uh, Fool's Fate just didn't hit. And I think uh, the, the the legacy character thing that I talked about earlier might have been a big reason. But also because it just it took too long to get there for me. So uh, that's with me, guys. I know that, like I said, I feel like it's going to kind of fall on the unpopular opinion. But you know what? I am always going to be honest with you guys here. I still do adore the series. It's... Right now, it is one of my top 10 uh, fantasy series of all time, without a doubt. Uh, but I do have some criticisms of it, just like I did Will of Time. Still plan on picking up the next books. Uh, me and Philip are taking a break while he is promoting his new book, The Way of Eden. Hope you guys picked it up. But we will be starting Rain Wild in June. So that was my thoughts on the Tawny Man, guys. Like I said, check out in May when the panel gets together and it's basically going to be the four of them ganging up on me and telling me I'm a heathen. And that's fine. That's fine. Uh, I, I'm sure that uh, they will teach me many a thing that I probably just went completely over my head because I know that uh, when we talked about Live Ship, they brought up something after we got off that call to talk about this trilogy and Derry and, and Madison completely blew my mind with something that I completely didn't get. So uh, that's going to happen. That's going to happen. And uh, that's why I love those discussions. I feel like they bring out a lot of stuff that maybe you didn't catch on your first read, you know, when you're talking to people who've read the series infinite amount of time. It's a lot of fun. So, guys, that was my thoughts on Tawny Man. What did you think? How would you rank uh, these three books? How would you rank the first three trilogies? Let me know down in the comments what you think, and I will talk to you there.